Well, I would like to welcome all of you um, to this Lunch Bites episode. I'm Karen Warner, and I'm part of the STEAM team at the California um, Californians Dedicated to Education Foundation, and this is going to be the Expanded Learning Opportunities um, webinar where we're really going to be talking about creative partnerships and um, about some funding that's available and uh, how to um, look at that funding with intention. So uh, to honor your time, we're going to get started right on time. Um, whether you're here for the first time or you've been with us with um, previous episodes of Lunch Bites, um, we ask you for right now to um, be on mute and uh, please, if you want to interact, we would love that um, and please use the chat for that. Um, we will have time later for some Q&A where you will be coming off mic. Um, and please assume best intentions. Um, we're all here to support each other. And uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to let us know your favorite board game, uh, I'd love to have a good list here. Then I can uh, see maybe if there's something new I haven't seen before. Um, and I have a, a nephew who um, has a cabinet. He's in his mid-30s, and I would say he probably has 150 games. It's a big cabinet. Um, so I would love it if I could find a game maybe that he doesn't already have. And Spinner, I'm seeing that uh, Deborah uh, had that one. I don't know that one, so maybe you've given me something he doesn't have. Oh, and I love Sorry. And, oh, yes. Sequence. And Yahtzee, Racco, Trouble. Oh, Quirkle. I haven't played that one in a while. So, <laughs> so right here you have a list if you're looking for... Uh, maybe a present for someone, uh, here's a list of some of the favorite games. So I've just helped you in your shopping. Oh yeah, and Racco, awesome. Well, we're gonna go ahead, uh, feel free to keep putting those in. Um, as I said, I, I, need a, I need a list. So I appreciate you helping me with this. Um, I, before we get fully started, I wanted to be sure that you knew about our May 18th event. Um, it's expanding opportunities with STEAM, and we really would love to have you join us there as well. Um, we are going to be talking about the expanded uh, learning opportunities grant funds today, and um, there will be some, a session there um, on the 18th, so it'll help you uh, take a deeper dive even. And we'd love to thank our sponsor, Chevron, the uh, human energy company, for helping us to put on uh, this programming. And please uh, let people know what you're learning uh, on social media. So our goal today, as it has been for other Lunch Bites episodes, we really want to provide space for you know, really good conversations and here within our STEAM community. Um, and also, you know, we want to be able to share some great resources with you. And we always try to bring something that can help you, um, maybe something you haven't tried before. Um, and so today we're inviting you as we're getting started to think about using, um, using this time also to take some creative sketch notes. So as you're learning, try maybe not just doing a bulleted list or just um, writing out just the words that you're hearing. Um, there's, I think, quite a body of research that shows that something like um, taking creative notes can help you to lock some of what you're learning into that uh, long-term memory. So um, try sketch notes, and at the end, we'll check in with you and see how it went, and if it's something you haven't done before, um, you might find that you like learning and remembering things this way. So now I would like to introduce you to Glennon Stratton, my STEAM team member, uh, co-teammate, and uh, he'll get us started on uh, what we're doing to, for the rest of the time together. So thank you so much, and Glennon, take it away. Thank you, Karen, um, and, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, in particular, you know, to, to set the stage as to where we're going today, we're going to talk a little bit about what the ELO, ELO or the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grants are, and then we're going to have a roundtable discussion with our guests. Um, and frankly, we were having conversations about what the ELO grants were as a group and wanted to just 
pull back the curtain and show you a work in progress. We don't have all the answers, but we're wrestling with how do we partner to use the expanded learning opportunities and, and make sure that we're serving students well. Um, so what are the expanded learning opportunities grants? Essentially, they're a large amount of funding that is going directly to local education agencies. And these local education agencies must submit their board approved plans to the Department of Ed by June 1st. And you might be wondering, well, why are we talking to all these expanded learning partners about this grant if they're flowing to the LEAs? And the answer is, is there's a lot of flexibility in how you can use these grants. This is the technical language that is in the bill and many of the materials that have been put out by CDE. And it's important to know as an expanded learning partner, the services that you provide to districts, the funds provided by the grant can be used for those services. Um, we're not going to go through each of these bullets, but they're here in the slides for you to reference and we have links to them at the end of the page um, or at the end of the slide deck. But we have a couple of examples of how these funds can be used or are planning to be used by some districts based on our conversation with Michael Funk, who's the director of the Expanded Learning Division. Um, we released a podcast with him, uh, not, I think it was yesterday, actually. Um, so there's more there as well. But some examples include registrations for summer learning opportunities provided by community organizations, rehiring para professionals, hands on science materials for summer learning professional learning for your staff. And when we talk about staff, we talk about your entire staff. That's classified staff, that's teaching staff, that's administrative staff. Um, so anything that could either support the student, the educators, or their families are things that these grants can be used for. There's a lot of flexibility in how these funds can be used. And if it's done with intention and done with integrity in the support of students, um, you have the flexibility to do that. Next slide, please. And so today's conversation, we've been having some collaborative conversations as a group. We're really excited to welcome Catherine, Lynn, and Vanessa from these amazing institutions that have been partners of ours for a long time. And to kick things off, I would just ask each of you to introduce yourself and share a little bit about what your organization does and why you're here today. And we'll start with Catherine. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Catherine or Katie Muniz and I'm the Director of Professional Development at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. And in addition to all kinds of, you know, sciencey activities for kids and our summer camp, uh, we've also created new virtual field trips that we've been rolling out this year, um, which are mostly free for teachers. And um, my team does professional development specifically for K-5 elementary teachers in underserved communities, um, specifically around NGSS, but also just uh, creating that comfort and confidence with teaching science, since that isn't often um, elementary teachers area of expertise. So in a nutshell, that's what we do at the Science Center. Thank you so much. Uh, Lynn, you're next on my screen, so I'm going to kick it over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Lynn Rankin. I'm the director of the Institute for Inquiry at the Exploratorium. Um, I'm representing the elementary wing of our work in professional learning. Uh, we work with both teachers, K-5 teachers and professional learning providers. We've been doing that um, via county offices throughout the state. And uh, we also have what's known as the Teacher Institute. To, which works at the secondary level. Um, and of course, all these wonderful exhibits that um, when we're open, kids, kids and families in the community can visit and, and have uh, real hands-on experiences face, well, face-to-face, face, -to -face, face, face to exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Lynn. Uh, Vanessa, could you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Vanessa Lujan and I work at the Lawrence Hall of Science. I am the deputy director of our learning and teaching group, which is our, our group that engages leaders and educators um, in school systems and out in capacity building and professional learning. Um, I also direct a program called the Bayside program, which um, over a decade ago was a partnership that started with the Exploratorium and the Lawrence Hall of Science. Um, 
now it is at uh, the Lawrence Hall of Science that really focuses on district capacity building efforts for equitable science, math, and environmental literacy um, learning opportunities. Uh, at the Lawrence Hall of Science, we also offer direct support to students and families to increase to increase student engagement, and that includes our um, family festivals, um, family nights, um, citizen science programs, uh, community-based environmental justice programs. So we um, work both with educators and leaders, and then also with students, like um, like the California Science Center and the Exploratorium. Thank you so much for sharing, Vanessa. Um, to kick things off with this discussion, you know, the three or four of us have had a few discussions about the expanded learning opportunities grants. What would you like the local education agencies that might be on this call with us today to know as they're making their plans for the use of these funds? I, I can start. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Um, I think that right now um, what we're hearing from our district partners is that um, everyone uh, is looking to all these different funds that are coming from both state and federal um, sources and um, i think that this right now is an opportunity um, like it always has been in the science education field for um, teacher and teacher leader advocacy um, I think that districts are asking their staff what they need because that's part of a component of the ELO grant application. They have to ask stakeholders um, what they want, similar to the LCAP process. And I think that this is a time um, to have a resurgence of advocacy, especially now um, after this past year where science um, instructional time has even reduced even more. Um, and so that's that's one of the, the things that I've been thinking about. The other thing that I've been thinking about is that it's really an opportunity for districts to um, uh, not do more of the same. We're hearing a lot of districts that say that they have learned a lot of lessons over this past year, and yet in the implementation and planning, you're seeing a lot of district plans that look the same. And so, um, you know, this is just a real opportunity to, to have districts think about capacity building efforts um, as a way to kind of leverage those funds because they are one-time funds um, and, and make those funding dollars last longer. Vanessa, thanks so much for sharing. I think you echo something that is coming up in my mind and that support, you know, to, to have a successful school, you have to have staff that feel supported and ready and capable. And um, that's a big component of how these funds can be used. I'm wondering if Katie or Lynn, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Well, I was going to take a slightly different perspective. Um, this year with COVID, the Exploratorium at the, the Institute for Inquiry in particular launched a lot of workshops for expanded learning um, programs. And that's not our usual uh, fair. We usually work in professional development with teachers. But serendipitously, when we were offering our workshops uh, for teachers, some of the, uh, colleagues from districts invited expanded learning programs from county office, associated with county offices to join. And what was wonderful is it turned out that um, what we were offering what worked for both groups. And we've never quite had that happen before. I think it was because we changed the way that we taught a bit this year because we were online. So I'm saying that because I think districts and also informal programs may not realize the resources that are out there because folks may not have been doing expanded learning per se, but that, um, that a lot of us have a repertoire that works for expanding learning, expanded learning programs. And so, um, you know, kind of reach out and be inventive in terms of your offerings. And I think you'll find uh, if you've just been working in the formal environment, 
you may have a lot to offer that you weren't aware of that works for expanded learning folks as well. I also would say that that bringing together of teachers and expanded learning um, educators has a lot of promise for the future where maybe collaborations can happen across and bridging can happen across. So I, I would just love to see that opportunity through these funds um, to be explored a little bit more and encourage people to do so. Lynn, thanks so much for sharing. That really echoes something uh, from the podcast with Michael Funk, uh, the director of Expanded Learning, in that we need community solutions to a community-wide problem. All of our institutions may feel like they're at capacity individually and don't have the capacity to do something new and immediate, but there's enough community educators and K-12 educators together to really support all of our students if we lean into each other and understand how we can partner and support each other. Katie, I see you nodding your head. Is there something you want to add? Sure. Um, I had a slightly different take as well. It's interesting to hear all the different perspectives. Um, what I was thinking was that during this past year, while teachers and schools and districts have just been in the eye of the storm, right? Just rolling with the punches, dealing with every new thing that came along, trying to figure out virtual learning, trying to figure out everything kind of on the fly with 30 kids staring at you while all your tech goes down, that kind of thing, right? Um, while all that was going on, we in the informal world, you know, informal educational uh, institutions, and specifically those of us doing teacher professional development, we're at the beginning at least kind of sitting around twiddling our thumbs going, oh gosh, what do we do? How can we help? We're closed. We can't bring teachers. We can't bring students. And so we've really been spending this past year really diving deep into what we can do to support teachers and students and having that time as unfortunate as it is, you know, because we were closed, having that time to learn so much about um, virtual learning, about expanded learning opportunities. Um, and kind of my second point, well, to finish that thought, was that um, that's, I think, one of the great benefits of having outside professional development is that we have that time that unfortunately sometimes teachers and district personnel don't have to really dive deep and, and um, create professional learning that's incredibly um, efficient and, and kind of getting that point across. Um, so then the second thing, sorry, I got myself off track. The second thing was doo -doo -doo, doo -doo 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 -doo, that science that we really believe and all of us here are science people that really that science can be that vehicle to engage students to re engage students back in school to re engage them in learning together. Um, and to and to engage one of the conversations that we were having when the four of us talked earlier was um, that, as we all know, ELA and math reign supreme, <laughs> uh, especially in the elementary uh, schools, and that we really believe science can be the vehicle to integrate all of that ELA and math learning that has been lost over the over the year with the science that clearly has been lost um, and really re-engage kids in learning in a whole new way that they might not have gotten before. Katie, I love that. I'm glad you called that out. I think one of the things that many science advocates have said for a long time is that science could be the connective tissue literally to all the other content areas. And if you think about it that way, it is hands-on, it is engaging, and it is a way to connect to other content areas. And so um, I appreciate you raising that. My next question for the panel is, there are certainly, and I'm seeing in our attendance list, we have other uh, expanded learning partner organizations, community-based organizations, nonprofits that are on this call with us today. What recommendations do you have for these organizations um, as they are looking to partner with a local education agency in their area around supporting this effort with the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grants? I could start that one. Um, I think what was the most useful for us, um, and I think I might be speaking for Lynn and Vanessa as well, is really being able to unpack the language of the grant 
and the bulleted list that uh, Karen and Glennon showed earlier and that they'll give, they'll give you all later um, is really helpful. Just really diving into those um, bullets, <laughs> I don't know what to call them, uh, different things that are possible to be funded and thinking creatively about what your organization can offer. Um, and it took me a couple of times going through it before I realized, wait a minute, there's a connection there to this program that we have. Here's a connection to this other program we have. So really thinking creatively and then using those buzzwords when presenting these ideas to the LEAs and really saying, hey, we see that these ELO, this ELO grant can cover um, professional learning for teachers in academic and engaging students. Uh, this program that we have specifically meets those goals in the following ways. So I just think that that really thinking creatively about how this might work with what you already have in place. Thank you so much, Katie. Lynn? And I would just say, reach out to the folks that you've been working with who may not see you as expanded learning um, uh, with an expanded learning focus. And so let them know that you're available and you're willing to tailor your programming. Um, you also want to make it authentic to yourselves, but um, just I, I think a lot of folks don't probably don't know that we in the informal world are really ready and available to help. So it's just it's uh, I think it's being proactive, actually. I think you have to be proactive because there's not a clearinghouse anywhere that does this for you. I appreciate that, Lynn. Vanessa? Yeah, um, I. You know, um, what we work all over the state. And so, you know, while we provide direct service service support to students and families in the Bay Area, we don't, you know, it doesn't make sense for our Lawrence Hall of Science um, Museum Educator team to fly down to Southern California. And so I think that community-based organizations know their communities the best. And you work with those kids already you might even have after school partnerships um, or other kinds of partnerships with the district. And so I think um, what we've learned over this past year is that districts actually had to rely on those community-based organizations to fill some of those educator spaces, you know, in learning hubs at school sites, or they were tapping into their after school programs um, to, you know, come during the school day to engage kids. Um, so I think just capitalizing already on that like depth of knowledge that community-based organizations have about your community. And then, um, you know, like, like we all do, um, reaching out to a district and knowing a district's goals before you come in and saying like, we know, what your goals are. They are social emotional learning, they are XYZ. Um, and just, you know, like remembering that you actually do know your community districts um, the best and, and just really um, reestablishing those relationships and communication channels. So to summarize a little bit what I heard from each of you, one, um, get familiar with the available uses of the funds and align the, your services as a community-based organization to those funds. Two, lean into the relationships you have. If you know someone at a district, we had a conversation about who's the right person at a district, especially when you have a big district. And, and the answer really is, it's the person you know the best um, is likely gonna be your best avenue. Uh, and three, community-based organizations do have expertise. And the other thing that I think is often forgotten um, is that community-based organizations can provide instant capacity to accelerate what's going on in a K-12 organization. Um, so I think reminding the, the K-12 space that, hey, we're here, we're available, we're able to use the funds that you have for the purposes that you need to, and we can provide the capacity you need immediately um, are, the, are three things to really take home from that question. You know, we started this dialogue that we had I don't know, a week or two ago at this point, maybe two weeks, um, via just an email chain to the three, the four respective organizations. What has come or what have you learned from collaborating across the organizations that you'd like to share with others? Because I think that's one of the important things is that there's an opportunity 
to collaborate with K-12, but there's also this opportunity to collaborate with other community-based organizations in your region. Well, when we start, um, oh. oh, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> Either way, um, sorry about that. Um, well, uh, as Glennon said, we started meeting a couple of weeks ago and we're kind of overwhelmed thinking about um, the potential. And I think one of the things that was really helpful is we realized between all of us that there's not a magic bullet. And I think each one of us thought maybe we weren't stepping up to the plate enough in terms of reaching out. Um, beyond the folks that we know. And, it, and so it was very comforting to know that we're all in the same boat, that we can support each other, um, whether we actually formally collaborate. It was, um, you know, it was reassuring to know that we're all thinking about this work in, this, in similar ways and that we can call upon each other as we um, put our programming together, our menu of opportunities and, and uh, draw upon the language that's going to resonate with, with districts. So I feel like I have uh, kindred spirit colleagues in this. Lynn, thanks so much for sharing. Um, one of the questions that just came in the chat, you know, one of the many things that you all specialize in is hands-on learning and hands-on inquiry, both for students and parents to experience directly and or for educators as PD models. Do you think safely managed hands-on inquiry is gonna be even more important as schools reopen? And if so, why? Sure, I can answer that. Um, I see some of my friends um, from uh, different districts um, that I've been interviewing um, for another project, but um, a lot of what we've heard across the state from districts is that that um, reduction in instructional time that teachers were facing with distance learning models, hybrid learning models, um, you know, small cohort in-person models um, really was uh, detrimental to kids experiencing hands-on science. Um, and, you know, there were districts that were really being creative and um, distributing materials and hands-on um, uh, materials baggies to their actual families and students, but others couldn't. And so, um, so I, I do think that there is a real, um, uh, you know, uh, hands-on science has not been happening as much as it was before, and it wasn't even happening very much before. Um, so, so I do think that it's really important for um, us community-based organizations, um, informal science institutions, um, after-school programs that elevate hands-on science to really advocate that this is what kids need right now, um, and it's what kids are going to need all into the next year and beyond. Thank you so much for sharing. We're winding in on the end of our time here. Um, and I want to transition. We're going to put a feedback survey in. We're going to hang out for a couple of extra moments for questions, but I have a, a couple of quick slides for you all um, with some resources and things. I want to thank all of our guests for being here. And um, Karen, you're taking the slides away from me. So back to the recommendations. Um, you know, to close things out, lean into your existing relationships clearly demonstrate how your partnership aligns to the use of the funds and make sure um, to communicate about your expertise. This slide is a huge list of resources. One, two that I really wanna call out are the first two. Um, one is a link to an overview document that we created with a sample communication. Um, I've seen similar communications go out. And so it's an outreach email that you can use and copy and paste. So feel free to do that. And it's really targeted for uh, expanded learning partners. And then the second one is the May 5th event. They're doing an entire day long virtual event about uh, the expanded learning opportunities. And there's a lot of great breakout sessions. So those are the two that I would call out specifically. And then there's a lot more links for additional information. Um, next slide, please. 
And as I mentioned, we have a new podcast out with the director of expanded learning. We talk specifically about this. He encourages everyone to seize this moment. And we really appreciate everyone being here. If you have questions um, and want to hang out, please do. Um, this concludes kind of our formal programming. As a reminder, we're hosting another event on May 18th. Would encourage all of you to join. Um, and thank you for being here. So our group's small enough. If there's a question, I would just say, uh, let us know by raising your hand. You can put it in the chat. If you want to uh, just come off mute, you can do that too. We'll hang out here for another five or so minutes uh, to address any questions and um, happy to be of support to everyone. So thank you so much. Lennon, I'm actually here. If anybody... Oh, hey, Michael. Hi. Thanks for being here. Great presentation. Thanks, panel. Michael, did anything come up for you as a, as a guest here that you wanted to reiterate or point out? Well, the only thing I would say is um, that this came up in a conversation previously today that um, right now the LEAs are being flooded with vendors. They're just left and right, left and right, because people have 4.6 billion reasons to call an LEA right now. And um, be mindful that there is so much noise for people involved in reopening schools, in planning the federal funds that are coming down, as well as this grant. And I, I, you know, I spent over 20 years as an ED of a community-based organization in San Francisco. And so I'm so passionate about, which is why I logged into this video, because I, I just, it's so much better when our K-12 system and communities partner together. It's just exponentially better. It's just not additive. And so just be mindful that these these statements that the panel recommended you take the approach of like your added value of your community base, your informal science expertise. You have so much that you're bringing that is, is more than just a curriculum or something off the shelf. And so just be mindful that you'll probably have to be persistent. You might have to get an ally to help you connect with the right person. I mean, just, but be creative, find a path and communicate who you are authentically and what kind of assets you can bring versus, uh, and just, just the knowledge that they're getting flooded with other people who want some of the, some of the pie. And which is not disparaging vendors at all. If you're a vendor here, I'm just I'm just just describing the situation. Thanks for sharing the context, Michael. Um, Henry, I see a question in the chat from you. If you're still with us, do you want to come off mute and ask the question? Yeah, this one would be for Michael Funk. Mr. Funk, how are you? I'm good. Great to see. <laughs> the question was, uh, no, we we understand that there's going to be a specific deadline for June of 2021 for different LEAs to submit the budget uh, for their um, monies, for the federal monies. But uh, that seems to be very, very tomorrow, <laughs> right? So it seems that it's gonna be so fast. So, uh, you know, for the districts to make the right call on whether it's gonna be the providers or the materials that they want to utilize to maximize their uh, efforts for student success, that should complete by 2024, for what I understand. Uh, will there be a possibility of an extension for these um, proposals of their LCAP? Well, we we like to make things as confusing as we can at the state level. So um, the LCAP is a different process and districts are doing them at the same time. Um, yes. The statute AB 86 calls for the uh -huh. expanded learning opportunities grant to be turned in no later than June 1, or I should yes. say approved by their governing board no later than June 1, and then sent to the county office. Uh, but to be really clear, and you, you folks can help us message that and send people to us if they need clarification, the budget that they submit 
is like a line item. We're going to spend a line item on this. There's no detail in terms of what materials they're going to use, who they're going to partner with, who they're who they're going to subcontract with, or any of that detail. Okay. And once it's turned in after once it's approved by the governing board on June 1st and approved and sent to their county office no later than June 5th, then it can change after that. So it's it's a living document. And that that is actually, that fact is posted on the CDE FAQ webpage that you can point to. So I'm taking the approach and part of the approach of May 5th is, yeah, people have to get their stuff in. They have to get it approved by June 1. But there's going to be a lot of work past June 1 yeah. Yeah. to figure out. I mean, most of these districts are going to be figuring out what to do after they turn in the plan. They're going to turn in broad categories and broad directional yes. things by June 1. And then, so I see Mara, I, I saw Danielle, part of our system of support for expanded learning. We're seeing that, you know, our work is really going to start after June 1 in terms of really supporting districts and how to figure this out. Uh, you did mention another date of through August, of, I mean, through the school year 22-23, um, the expanded learning opportunity funds can be, are available for expenditure through August 2022, which contradicts what it says in the opening of AB 86 when it says the funds can support school year through school year 22-23. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, we try to make things confusing, but you know the legislation was done quickly, but some of these things were, were not caught and questions are coming up like, well, what if I contract with somebody in August of 2022 for a multi-year contract? Well, the, the, the bill says expenditure, not encumbrance. Uh, but realize there's a whole layer these are state funds and ESSER 3 is coming forward. There's a, California is going to get 15 billion. You yes. know, money is not the issue here. And Henry, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I think we're going to call it a wrap. I, I really appreciate our guests for being here. Michael, thanks for dropping in and joining us again. It's uh, nice to spend time with you multiple times in the same week. And uh, we hope everyone has a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And thanks all thanks to everyone for all you're doing for kids. It's just it's so phenomenal to have such great partners uh, working with our district. So thanks thanks for hosting, Glenn and Karen. Good to see you again. Yep. Good to see you. Thank you everyone for coming.